Amen. You know, I just want to um, say I thank God for another opportunity to come. You know, I I kind of got the tail end of Sonia's testimony, but um, what I thank the Lord for is that I had the opportunity of talking to my sister on yesterday and to just hear her say things that she's never said before. When you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, it breaks down all those barriers and all of that false stuff in you and all that pride and all of that trying to save your identity and save your name and look good before people. God has a way when he, you have an encounter with his spirit of breaking all of that stuff down and then letting the real you show forth. And so for me, I thank God because she said, no, I'm not putting no more blame on nobody else. Everything I did was my own fault, my own choosing. And so, you know, that that is appropriate because today our lesson is, as you can see, the title is, Why Are You Salty? Why Are You Salty? And I want us to talk today for a little bit about where God wants us to go. But even before I do that, you know, now I'm not a singer, but on yesterday in the worship that I was in, I just kept hearing the Lord say, I just kept hearing over and over again, the glory of the Lord. And I just began to kind of sing in my own head. But it was just like, Lord, bring your glory. Amen. Lord, let us stand in your glory. Let your glory fill us. Let your glory fill the presence. Father, everything in me that needs to be touched by your glory, touch me. Change me. Transform me. Heal me. Deliver me. Set me free. Equip me. Help me to be everything you've called me to be. And that happens in the glory. That happens in your presence. Lord, forgive me for moving away, for being shy, for being afraid to come into your glory. Because in your glory, in your presence, there is healing. In the glory, in your presence, there is deliverance. In your glory, in your presence. There was peace and beauty. I, I, mean, I wish I could sing because it just kept here. In your glory, Lord. In your glory, Lord. In your glory, Lord. There is healing. In your glory, Lord. I just kept hearing that. In your glory. Lord. I mean, Lord, in your glory, in your glory, is the things that we need. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Lord, we thank you today. We come and stand before your people. We stand in your glory. We stand in your presence. We stand in your healing, your anointing, your authority. And we stand today to speak the words that your people need to hear. We stand today, Lord God, to set somebody free today. We stand, Lord God, to break the word before your people so that they can get the things that they need to be able to stand strong and to be able to do what you've called them to be. In your glory today, Lord God, we stand and seek your face. In your glory, Lord God, we want you to have your way in us. We want you to change us. Lord God, we don't want to leave this place like we came in. We don't want any longer, Lord God, to come in and out and never be changed. Lord God, help us today because, Lord God, we don't want to turn salty. We don't want to look back. We don't want to go into old places and old behaviors and old things that would keep us from being able to be who you called us to be. In your glory, Lord God, today we want to see you. So, Father, today preach through me. Speak through me. Touch through me. Heal through me. Deliver through me. Have your way through me. Everything you want to do, Lord God, do it. I don't want to leave this place and have leaving anything undone that you want done. In the name of Jesus, we declare it. Amen and amen. amen. I'm reading from Genesis, the 19th chapter. The 15th through the 26th verse. And then many of you know this, this piece of scripture. It's just a, you know, very popular scripture. I mean, you know, everybody knows about Lot and his wife. But I just hope today that I give you a different perspective on Lot's wife. So reading from um, Genesis 19, starting verse 15, it says, And when the morning arose, then the angel hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in an iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the wife, 
the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto him, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now the servant has found, if the servant has found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast shown unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain. Lest some evil take me and I die. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it's a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zor. The sun was risen unto, upon the earth when Lot entered into Zor. Then the Lord rained down upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire for the Lord, from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew these cities and all the plains and all the inhabitants of the city that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Now let me read one other scripture. It's Luke 17, 32. It's one verse. It says, remember Lot's wife. Thank you, Lord, for the reading of this word. Now, let me just give you a little bit of background. You know, many of you know I'm a storyteller, so I got to put it in perspective. I want you to kind of get the picture. Going back to Genesis 18, we see in Genesis 18, and I didn't give you the scripture, but I'm just giving you the overview of Genesis 18. This is when God visits Abraham. The angels of the Lord are walking with Abraham, and God is speaking to Abraham about his <coughs> desires. And if you look in that chapter of uh, Genesis 18, 17, one verse it said, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the things which I do? So God, I mean, Abraham sort of had such a relationship with God that God didn't want to hide from him the things that he was doing. So God was going to, at this point, begin to reveal to Abraham the destruction that he was getting ready to bring on Sodom and Gomorrah. And so we see that also in, in 18, in verse 20, and it says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous. And in 21, it says, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. See, God was talking to Abraham. And I, I needed us to see this about Abraham before we could really go in and look at the scripture that I said. And so what happened? Immediately when God tells Abraham what he's getting ready to do, what, what does Abraham do? He begins to intercede. So he began to say, God, will you save the city? He said, will you save it for 50? And they have this dialogue. He said, okay, well, that's good. Will you save it for 40? Or will you save, he eventually got there and said, will you save it if it's for 10 sake? And so the point that I want us to look at even as we go forward is, you know, some of us were in our own Sodom and Gomorrah. Places where God said, your sin is so grievous to me, I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to destroy the place where you dwell. I'm going to destroy all the inhabitants. I'm going to destroy your Sodom and Gomorrah. But an Abraham, a person, a father-like figure, a father or a mother, somebody had a father's heart, a mother's heart said, no, Lord, because you and I have fellowship, because you listen to me and you tell me your plans, I'm coming to you and I'm asking, would you intercede? Would you have mercy on this place? For 50, okay, maybe it's not 50, but even down to the 10, would you have mercy on this place? And so God says, okay, I'll do that. But, but the sorry part about it is he didn't even find that many in Sodom. He didn't even find that many. How many people have been interceding on our behalf and saying, Lord, would you save that individual? Maybe they got four good qualities about them. Or maybe they got one or two good qualities and God can't find them. He can find no good qualities about you. Why? Because you don't want to do that which his son he came to help us to do. He looked at your sin and it was so grievous that he said that destruction is coming. But think about it also this way. Somebody was interceding. God sent an Abraham to pray for you, interceding on your behalf, asking God to not to destroy you in your foolishness and your sin, but like, and then when God's going to send some help, instead of us moving forward and help, we do like Lot's wife turn around and become salty. 
but God has some plans. Amen. And so now we move. Now that was now, and as, as soon as we come out of what happens in 18, as soon as we come to chapter 19, we see God is already getting ready to call out his plan. So he sends these angels to Sodom in this in, in um in his evening time. And so it says, Lot sat at the gate. When you look at the first part of 19, Lot sat at the gate. And when he saw the man coming in, he rose up and he went to talk to him. And he asked him to come and, and be at his house. And, and at first they refused, but he eventually said, okay. Um, I, they said, okay, they'll go. But what the scripture says, as soon as they began to lay down, the men in the city came and started to beat at Lot's door because they wanted to have sex with the men. And so they just, I mean, we, when you talk about it, they were beating at the door to the point that it was like they didn't care. They wanted to ravish these men. Um, but the angels, who, they really, who these men were, really was the angels. They pulled Lot out. They, they blinded these men. But really and truthfully, these men were already blind. Amen. They were blind because of their sins. And even in this point, you know, that Lot was trying to appease them. He tells them, well, you know, I have two daughters that don't have it known men that he was going to even give. He was going to sacrifice his two daughters to stop what was going to happen. And we see that in 19 and 8. He was going to sacrifice his daughters. What, an, what a horrible point and what a horrible thing to see what's going on. But God's intervention was beginning. God sent the angels to bring about his justice on the, in the city. And I want us to look for a minute. Lot is sitting at the gate. So he saw who went in and out. But nowhere in scripture do I see that Lot was bothered to even be concerned about what was going on in the city. On the other hand, we have Abraham who said, Lord, wait a minute. Because me and you are in fellowship, I'm walking with you and talking with you. We're in fellowship. And you took the time to tell me about what's going on in the world and in the situation. And what did I do? I interceded. I began to pray. But nowhere do it tell me that Lot saw all this grievous things inside of him more and did anything about it. He sat and watched. Too many of us are sitting and watching people die and go to hell, and we're not doing anything about it. And we're watching people in their sin. We're watching people do sins that they think are hidden, but not really hidden, because God will not reveal what you're doing. And we see these things, and what happens? We say nothing. But we're sitting in places and positions, because if you're sitting in the gate, you don't miss anything. God says, I need some people that are supposed to be gatekeepers to really start keeping the gate. If you're in the gate, you're supposed to be watching to see other people coming in and out and are doing what I've called them to do. And if they're not, you begin to intercede. You begin to pray. You begin to fast. You begin to seek what it is that I want to happen in that place. But it didn't appear that Lot had any concerns about that. He stayed there. He built a residence there. He took up roots in a place of wickedness. Many of us find ourselves and our families in our own Sodom because we've settled in, we've become comfortable with the conditions. Instead of making them a matter of prayer, and when we don't, what happens is we find ourselves with our families being destroyed. We find ourselves where things are coming in and what we want it to be and who we want it to be have been changed because we've allowed the conditions of the sin to take over. Amen. See, then that leads us to where we were today, our scripture today. And the angel couldn't find ten. So what happens? The city is set to be destroyed. However, God still in his mercy is going to save Lot's family. And he tells them to leave quickly. See, I just a note, let me just pin a note right there for you. Some of us think that we got saved or that our lives have changed because of what we did. You were too ignorant. I was too ignorant to even know how to pray for myself. But God put us on the heart and mind of somebody else that was praying for us. That saw that we was walking around in Sodom and Gomorrah and fine with the condition, fine with the, the elements, fine with the lifestyle, even if it was grievous and sinful to God. But somebody put God put us on somebody's heart and said, pray for them. And because of your prayer for them, I'm going to step in and lead them out of Sodom. I'm going to lead them out of their sin. I'm going to show up in their situation. They're going to give them an encounter with me so that they can be changed. And so God was merciful. And so he tells the angels, tell them, okay, run out of here. Go run to the mountain. But, you know, so you could be saved. But Lot says, well, no, um, that's too far. Let me go to Zorah. That's quicker and, and then I won't be destroyed. Well, it's some, it's some significant points that we want to look at. 
So what's the point I want to make from this piece of scripture? Well, God had been merciful, as I said. Not because he deserved it, but oftentimes it's because of someone praying for us. You and I are in these places because somebody prayed for us. You know, there was a song, it's like somebody's praying for you. You know, somebody's on their knees praying for you. Your grandmama prayed, your mama prayed, somebody prayed for you and saw you through. Somebody was interceding on your behalf and asking the Lord to save you. And in his mercy, he tells you, he says, okay, here's the help. God shows up himself to, his, to your situation. He tells you what? Run to the mountains. What does the mountain represent? Well, mountains mean going to an elevated place so that you can be saved. God comes and says, okay, I want to save you. I'm going to bring you out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, Sodom and Gomorrah was not just a place, but it become a condition. The lifestyle, you know, the, the, the homosexuality was there. There was a lifestyle. There was a culture that they had gotten saturated, you know, just saturated in. And so God is sending the angels, I want you to go to the mountain. I want to elevate you so high up from where you were that you can't even remember where you were. He want to elevate us in our thinking. God says he wants to transform your mind and give you a new mind so that you no longer conform to the world or the condition that you've been in. He want to elevate your behavior. He is telling you, I want you to look like my son, act like my son, walk like my son, think like my son, talk like my son. But I need you to do that in the elevation of your thinking, of your behavior. Elevate it in your action. Elevate it in your spirit. I need you to come up out of the places where you work. I need elevation to happen in your life. But instead we say, no, I want to go to Zora. The mountain is too far. That's too far to go. How many of us fall short of getting to the elevated place God wants us because we are scared that we go, it's too far. It's too much energy. It's going to take too much. I might have to give up too much. I don't want to I don't want to make all those sacrifices to go to the mountain. So I want to go to Zora. Zora means to be to grow insignificant or small. It is comparable to being small or insignificant. In other words, God is saying, I want you to go elevate you to the mountain and you want to settle for small. You want to settle for insignificant. You want to settle for some place that I never meant for you to be. You want to go someplace and be isolated or, or, or to get lost because you were too lazy to make the journey to get to a place that I would save, save you. To me, I'm thinking, I don't care. If I, you know, I don't care if it was 10 blocks or whatever. To me, I'm like, he's going to rain down on Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's going to burn it up. I want to be so far away from the burn up, I want to make sure no sparks, no flames, you know, because I think God is a big explosion. So I don't want to be nowhere close to where the potential spark may be. But because of people's laziness, lack of discipline, lack of, you know, arrogance, so many other things in our life, we say to ourselves, oh, well, I can't make it. Because as we say, oh, that's too much for me. Something happened to be horrible on the way. Why would God send you some angels to get you somewhere and then go leave you by yourself? <laughs> Duh, he ain't going to leave you. He's going to go with you. And too many of us will not grow up and go to the place God wants us to because we're selling ourselves short. We're stopping in Zora and we're staying in insignificant places that keep us from being everything God wanted us to be. He wants to elevate us today. Amen. He wants to elevate us today. He don't want us staying too close to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because can I tell you, when you stay too close to the sin, it is too, that much easier to draw you back. Because think about it. If you have to walk a block and your sin is right there, it's kind of not, well, this ain't too far a distance. I can walk back over here. But if you got to walk from here to Michigan, it might be a little bit more likely not to walk back to Michigan. Mm -hmm. So God had a plan. God is saying, move. Go the distance. Let me take you all the way. Stop, 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 stopping short. Because you know what else happens when we stop short? Not only do we get salty, but we lose out on the things that God has for us. I don't know about nobody in here, but I'm going to tell you something. I have come too far. I've gone through too much stuff. I am not stopping short of all what God has for me. I want to see every miracle. I want to see every deliverance. I want to see every blessing. And I'm not going to let sin be in my life and keep me short. And I don't want to be foolish enough. And you better about not be foolish enough to think that you can do sin before God and he don't see you. I might not see you, but you know what? As a prophet of the Lord, he'll show me your business. He'll show me what you're doing. And then I know you ain't supposed to be doing it. And guess what? I ain't gonna, I might not say nothing to you, but that don't 
don't mean I'm interceding like Abraham. That I'm not praying that God sends somebody into your Sodom and your Gomorrah and begin to talk to you and let you know he don't want you living in a sinful condition. He don't want you out there doing stuff that he ain't told you that you know you ain't supposed to be doing. Amen. But too many of us, we get comfortable. And that's one of the tricks of the enemy. He think, makes you think, nobody see you. Your sin is hidden. You can just tell them anything. But you don't lie to me. You can tell me anything. You're not lying to me. Why would you lie to the Holy Spirit? Because that's really who you're lying to. When you come before God's leaders and you tell them, you know, Sonia can come in and say, oh, yeah, you know, I ain't giving my tithes because I lost my job. Well, you know, I, I may not know Sonia lost a job. God knows she lied. Yeah. So, you, first of all, you didn't owe it to me. The commitment wasn't to me. And we have to start looking at your commitment is not to me. I might be the leader. James might be the leader. You might be the pastor. This, but, but your commitment is not to me. Your commitment is to God. And if you're not what God tells you to be, then you got to deal with God. And so Zora means grow insignificant or small. I'm just going to call you to church today, and I'm going to tell you, let's stop living small. Let's stop living small. God has the great destiny for each one of us in this house. God has purpose. He wants you to do something with your life. And he wants to be the one that leads you. He wants to be the one that says, okay, go there. I, you don't get to tell God. I mean, you know, the angels were nice enough to say, okay, I'll let you stop short. God is a, God is a generous God like that. Even though he don't want you to be in small and insignificant, he'll let you stop as small and insignificant. He'll let you stop there. But I don't want God to let me stop at insignificant. I'm like, Lord, if you got to drag me, drag me. I give you the permission ahead of time. Take me. I don't want to stop at insignificant. I don't want to stop at small. Because that's not what you called me for. You didn't call me to just stop in small places that are insignificant, don't matter, and nobody even see in the first place. You called me to be a person of influence. He's called all of us to be a person of influence. If your influence ain't for one person, it still called you to be a, a person of influence. And see, the other thing is they were staying too close to Sodom. When you're too close to something, you can still smell the smell of it, the smell of it, the sin of it, the memories of it. Too many of us are too close to the sin, and we wonder why we can't get deliverance because we're too close to it. We rubbing up just far enough along the line. We're thinking, okay, I ain't really sinning, but you so close that the memory of the sin is still there, and it's the potential for you to turn around and to turn back and to turn salty. So why do we turn back? Well, let's look at Lot's wife. It talked about how she lagged behind. She was behind um, Lot. She lagged behind. Now, I know some of the commentaries said, you know, that was kind of the tradition that the wife kind of always walked behind the husband. But even still, when I look at it, you walking behind, but you're unprotected. When you lag behind, there's nobody there to really check you to make sure that you're looking forward and moving in the right direction. See, we got to make sure if the Holy Spirit is leading you, don't be trying to lag behind the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Don't be trying to lag behind God's move. Don't be trying to lag behind the things that God has told you to do. If he told you, do A, B, and C, you better be doing A, B, and C. Don't be trying to stay over here at D and hoping A, B, and C will eventually get done. You better do what God tells you to do, when he tells you to do it, how he tells you to do it, and you need to move accordingly. Because the enemy is looking for the laggers. Don't you know in the wild, what animal gets snatched? Those weak ones that lag behind. If they don't stay with the pack, they get, they get devoured by the lions. See, the, the, the animals that stay close and that can, they can keep up, so it's not just staying close, but can keep up. If you think, you, even if you're close, but you're not keeping up, the enemy already got you in his focus. He's looking at you saying, ah, oh, okay, that's the one I'm going at. And he, him and all of his devices will come and corral you. He'll begin to try to stimulate you. He'll be trying to work on your senses because he'll be moving here and he get your face off the focus of the group and the pack and he'll pull you away. And in other words, the enemy will try to roll up in your life get you, entice you with stuff and things and money and drugs and jobs and sex and all this other stuff. He'll try to entice you and when you look that way, your focus is no longer on the family of God and he'll snatch you right where you are. She was lagging behind. We need to stop lagging behind. It's time for us to run. I did the prayer on Thursday about being a runner. One thing about a runner, you can't have both feet on the ground. So you ain't got time enough. When you're running, 
It's both one foot is at all times the foot is up. That means you don't have time enough to grow no root under your feet. You don't have time enough to be stagnant because you are moving. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. And the Hebrew word for looking back means more than that she just did this. It means she looked back and began to regard and to seek and to look and to pay attention to what was behind us, behind her. Sometimes what happens is when we look back and we become salty is because our focus then is not on what we should be going and what we should be doing, but on what we left behind. And so what did she leave behind? Well, you know, I've read the scripture many times and I know many of you did. Maybe I might be a little more scholarly and smarter than I am. But you know, when you read the scripture, what did it say? It said they grabbed Lot, his wife, and their two daughters. She had more than two daughters, though. She had more than two daughters. How do I know that? In 19 and 14, it says Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters. Now, we automatically assume that it was the same daughters, but they can't be. Because the other daughters, he said they never knew a man. If they never knew a man, they ain't had no husband. Because if they'd have known a man, they'd have been rocked in stone. So these were virgins. I doubt that the virgins had husbands. So they had, they had more, and he said son-in-laws with an ex. So most scholars say that they probably had about four daughters. So guess what? She looked back and there was a regret that all of her family wasn't coming with her. Sometimes we lose our footing because we let our families hold us back. Some of us can't move forward because we looking back worrying about our sons and our daughters and our sisters and our brothers and our mothers and our fathers. Guess what? Everybody got to take this journey for themselves. Everybody to make the decision. You got to be an Abraham and pray, but you got to move when God tells you to move. You don't want your life to become salty because you done turned around and, and began to have regret in your heart about decisions that somebody else made. I can't make a decision for you. I can't make a decision for my children. I can't make a decision for my husband. I can only make a decision for Jewel, and I'm going to make that decision, and I'm going to run with it. I'm going to pray for my husband. I'm going to pray for my children, but I'm not letting nobody, not a person, Stop me from being everything God has for me. And that oftentimes is we look behind and we let our families and, and our relationships, and it might even be your natural family, but it's relationships. We let relationships that we attach to. And some of these relationships, God done told us to let go of a long time ago, but we ain't let go of them because they, 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 they right here. We done been so close to them. See, we've been so close to these Sodom and Gomorrah relationships that we don't know how to let go of them. We're afraid if we let go of them, like, like Lot was. He was afraid to go to the mountain because he thought he would get weary in the process. Some of us can't let go of what's behind us because we're afraid we're going to get weary in the letting go. We, we start thinking, I'm going to get lonely, or I'm not going to have this, or who's going to be my man, or who's going to be my woman. We start worrying, am I going to have enough money if I leave this job that the Lord told me to leave? Am I going to be able to do this? I'm gonna... So we start worrying about these things, and God is saying, let them go, because guess what? He's not going to take you to the mountain and leave you there in an elevated place without provision. He is not going to do it. He's going to make sure you have provision. He's going to make sure you have everything you need. You just need to follow. You just need to go in the place that he says go. And sometimes we don't go because we're still too close to the draw of the old ways. See, I've watched people get saved and excited about their salvation. Then they got to walk it. When they have to walk it, they look at the mountain and say, ooh. That mountain really looked too far away. It's a lot farther away than I thought. I thought when I got saved that, that I was going to be right at the mountaintop, or at least at the base of the mountain. No, that's called a journey. That's a walk to holiness. That's a walking out your soul salvation. There's a process that you got to go through. God got to clean us up on the inside. Too many of us don't want to realize we got some stuff in us, Lord Jesus, that need to be cleaned up. Some attitudes, some behaviors, some ways of doing it. And we've been for years calling it, oh, that's just the way she is. Now the devil is a liar. That's a sin. She mean as a snake and she need deliverance. That old nasty attitude of her, that ain't just how she is. Maybe that's how she become, but that ain't the way God made her. And we got to stop giving people the okay and the thumbs up for them to stay in these conditions. But people don't want to go the distance. But I'm just challenging each of you. Don't stop in Zorro. 
don't stop at insignificant. Make sure that you go all the way to the place that God has for you. And then sometimes we don't go because what has happened is what has what has we have accepted as right what God has said is unacceptable. And now we, we feel like to some degree, I have a right to live this way. I have a right to the choices I made. And I can, you know, God just don't have to, and we don't say it out loud because we ain't that crazy, but we live like we're telling God, well, God, you just accept my decisions. You just accept that I'm going to do this this way. You're going to be all right with it, God, because you still love me, and you, you still God. Yeah, he is, but no, he not. He not just accepting any old thing. And I'm just telling you, we need to come to a day, because I'm just going to be honest. Y'all might not like me, but that's okay, because there's a lot of people don't like me. So that's not even, that stopped being a desire for me a long time ago, for folks to like me. I mean, you know, I just had to get delivered from people. People ain't going to like me. But I have to be truthful. God, I'm not going to preach y'all no message that just say, okay, you're going to get a million dollars, praise Jesus, you're going to have a big car, big house, and you're going to have all the things that you want. You go, you know, wonderful. But that ain't happening. You ain't living right. God ain't blessing you in your mess. And if you get blessed, don't start saying, oh, thank God, because he did it, because the devil will give you stuff. He can give you all kind of stuff. So we need to start, you know, because I see people in relationships going, oh, this God is in this. No, he ain't. What, show me in the world where God says, I am for fornication or I am for adultery. You show me. Now, I'll wait. Somebody show me that in the world because you can't. But you may have made a decision to do that, but God still looks at it as sin. And I didn't make it up. You got to like me, but that's what the words. And sometimes our problem is because we stay too long to the strong attachments and we cannot find ourselves moving away from those places. But what I thank the Lord about is that we don't have to stay there. We don't have to stay there. Because God, that, that scripture in Luke where it says, remember Lot's wife. God was telling them something. Because he had told them, when you read the rest of that in context, he really was talking about people are going to try to go back when, the, when God comes immediately. People are going to be trying to go back to get their stuff. They're going to be trying to go back and, you know, get the things that's important to them, that's valuable to them, whether the value is furniture, house, cars, whatever. But they're going to be trying to run back to get the stuff that's important to them and say, you better remember Lot's wife. What happened to her? She turned into a pillar of salt. And the Hebrew for pillar refers to like a garrison or a deputy. That is something that is set to watch over something else. So can you imagine Lot's wife turned to a pillar of salt at the Dead Sea area? where there's no life. So, in other words, God is saying, when you turn back to those areas that I have called you from, they turn you back and now you become a watchman over the dead things. You become a statue. Statues don't move. Statues often can be forgotten. They, you know, crazy thing happens to statues. But guess what? Your, your ever view is of a dead sea that's going nowhere. Dead sea with no life. Dead sea. And you know, many of us are in positions where we turn back. We become salty. We become angry. We become bitter. And guess what's happening? We are stuck. Now we become watchmen over our anger. Watchmen over our bitterness, watchmen over our issues, and for year after year after year after year after year, we stand and look at a dead situation, dead seas, things with no life. But what I do love about the Lord, what I love about the Lord is this. Lot's wife, that was it. She didn't get an opportunity to turn. But because of Jesus Christ, you can get an opportunity. I can get an opportunity. We don't no long, longer have to be stuck looking at our dead situations. We can come to a place where the Lord will deliver us. We can come to the place where God can set us free from some stuff. I don't care the stuff you don't have from birth. If you want to let go of it, you don't have to be salty. You don't have to be stuck in a place of death. You don't have to be stuck in a place where you're not growing. You don't have to be stuck in a place where your only visual is of a dead place, of a dead condition. And some of us are looking at all this dead stuff because of what we don't want to let go of. Amen. And my question to you is, why are you turning back? Why are you getting salty about it when God told you that's the way he didn't, he didn't want you there? Why are you turning back? 
Why are you turning back? God said, why are you turning back? Why are you turning away from the salvation that I put in your life? Why are you turning away from the miracles that you've seen? Why are you turning back from the blessings that I have from you? Why are you turning back? He said, stop turning back and move up to the mountain. Stop trying to settle in Zora in a place of insignificance, a place that does not hold your destiny, a place where there's really nobody there. That's why I live. Don't nobody want to be in Zora. Why are you trying to make your fit in a place that God doesn't want you to be in the first place? He said, move forward. Move out. Make it to the place of the destination that he got for you. Climb the mountain. Yes, it's going to take some work because you and I can't climb the mountain. Some of us can't hardly worship long enough because we out of breath. But God said, you want to build up not only your physical body, but he said, build up your spiritual body so that you can run this race without getting weary. You can run this race and not give up. You can run and not get weary. And if you get weary, he's going to roast raise you up on wings of eagle and you will learn how to soar. So even though you might get tired of running, stop running and fly. If you might get tired of going you know, this way and you can't see because it's dark. But some of us say, well Lord, maybe I'll go, but it's dark now. I don't want to move. He said, that's all right because if it's dark, I'm your path. I'm your light at your feet and I'm your light at your path. Why? So that way when you go and I can see you, you can see where I'm standing and you can see where you need to go. God is saying, get up. Get up. Get out of here quickly. Because he lied. If you go back, lied that even though they told him I'm getting ready to destroy the city, the angel had to snatch him by the arm and drag him out. How many of you got to be one? The Lord got to keep dragging you out of sin. He got to keep snatching you out of the, 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 the grips of the devil. Stop letting it have to be snatched out. Why don't you come out? Why don't you go do what God has called you to do so that you can be who he's called you to be? I'm, I'm just angry at the devil. I'm angry at what I see God's people do. And, and I'm talking about God's people. I ain't talking about the unsaved. I'm talking about these, because these are God's people. These are God's people. These are the ones that, that, that walked with, you know, Lot walked with Abraham. So he knew about some of the promises of Abraham. He, he was Abraham's nephew. He saw it. He had some visual of what it looked like to be godly. So he didn't not know anything. He had some connection. Too many of us had a little connection and then we think we got enough to go on off on our own. I can do it on my own. I got it together. You ain't tell me nothing. You can't tell me because I got it. If God don't speak to me, I ain't listening to you. That's foolish. Because God will talk to you, but God talked to you in different ways. He talked to you through the word. He talked to you through the spirit. And he talked to you through your leaders. And he talked to you. He had talked to you through a child. He can tell that child right now to stand up and say something and she'll say it and it'll be him speaking. You can't say, well, that's just... Lenaya. Because God is speaking. He can use whoever he wants. We got to stop discerning if the vessel is the one we want to listen to. And you got to hear what God is saying to you. He said, why are you turning back? Why are you getting salty? Why are you turning the salt? Why are you letting the things in life keep pulling you backwards when I am trying to move you forward? Because I tell you this. God has taken us somewhere. We might be small at this moment. But there's going to come a time when you walk in here, ain't going to be a seat to find you're going to be standing along the walls. It's coming a time when we might move to two, three services because that's how God is going to move over you. And the point is that God is saying, don't none of y'all turn back because you turn back. Guess what? It's not even about us. So it's not, this ain't, I ain't putting no, you know, no curse on you if you leave. But I'm just saying, don't move if God got a position and a place and something that he wants you to do. Stop turning back. Stop turning back. Stop looking backwards when God is telling you to move forward. Because God wants to do something. Because I'm going to tell you something else that happens when you look back. You lose out on the blessings and the healings that God has for your life. Because you're running away from what he had. Because see, had not gone the distance, I'm just going to make my own surmise here. But had he gone the distance, guess what stuff he could have eliminated? He could have eliminated the fact that his daughters had sex with him. So guess what? To have, so they could have their own sons. They had that, they still had that perversion that they had gotten from Sodom and Gomorrah. That perversion was still in their heart. See, but had he gone the distance in the walking, maybe, you know, they could have walked a little bit and then they walking a little bit, God could have sent some angels or God's presence could have came with them because 
God could have said, you know, Lot, I want to make a change in your life. You didn't do it right because who told you to stop in Sodom and Gomorrah anyway? Did I ever tell you that's where I wanted you to go? You looked at it and you made a decision because it looked a lot of greenery. It looked good. And you made decisions on your feelings, on your emotion, on your sight. You didn't trust in me. So maybe as they walked along the way, God could have began to transform Lot and say, you know what? I'm going to have you no longer make a decision on what stuff look like, feel like, taste like. I'm moving you out of your senses and I'm moving you into the spirit. And maybe when he talked with him a little bit longer and walked with him a little longer, guess who else could have been there? His wife could have been there because he could have been side by side with her as the lead of his house, pulling her along with him so that she wouldn't have been lagging behind. He could have had his daughters. He could have said, yeah, I know that all of our family didn't come, but we're going to thank God for those that did get saved because they had a choice too, but they decided to stay in their sin. And we're going to move forward and, and, and control the um, and make sure that our destiny as a family is not hindered. And many of us need to start doing that. We need to start saying, Lord, walk with us along the way as we seek to go to the high mountain. Walk with us, Lord God, so that when you talk with us, you can let us know. Stop making decisions out of your flesh. Stop making decisions out of your emotions. Stop making decisions out of what feel good, look good, and sit. Stop making decisions out of your senses and start making decisions out of the spirit. Start looking and hearing what I'm telling you. And when you hear what I'm telling you, then you'll move forward and you'll move and you'll walk. And guess what? If you walk, it might be a distance to get to the mountaintop and get to the fullness of the elevation, but you need to desire it in your heart. And when you get a desire in your heart and walk after it, seek after it, fight after it, guess what? Yeah, it might have been some danger along the way, but who said this walk was easy? Who said this walk didn't have some pitfalls and, and some sad ways and some Walks in the road and your feet might not get tired. Well, your feet get tired, you gotta shuffle them along, shuffle them, do whatever you gotta do, but don't stop. Don't turn back. You don't wanna get salty. Amen. You don't wanna become that pillar of salt standing and looking on things that have died. Because she looked back and what she looked on was what was dead. She didn't look back and see her stuff no more because it was it was gone. And so we're looking back at stuff that God has killed and we let it kill us. Stop looking back. It's time to move forward. It's time to listen to God. God said many of us, you know why many of us can't move forward? He said a lot of y'all can't move forward because you got too much fear in you. You got fear of commitment. You got fear of the things that God is saying you need to do. So you don't want to commit to him and do what he's showing you to do because what happens is you're afraid that it's going to be too much. You got that spirit of lot right now of saying, no, wait a minute, that's too much. Well, I just curse that spirit a lot right now in the name of Jesus. You're going to do what God says do. You're going to move forward without fear, without intimidation, and with knowing that God is going to help you make the distance. That he is going to carry you the entire way. Because if he said he'll bring you to it, he will surely bring you through. God said, why are you turning back? Stop turning back. Don't let nothing, no distractions. No distractions. Even the crying of the baby, don't let that be a distraction. And I'm just going to talk to y'all. Stop letting that be a distraction. I don't care if she come in here and roll on the floor. You make sure you bring that baby in this house. That child right there, when I used to take her to church, she used to embarrass me so much. I love you, dear. But she embarrassed me so much. She would get on the floor and she would roll the entire, I have all cute and, you know, dressed and all beautiful. She would get under the pews and she would roll from one end of the pew to the other. And she wouldn't stop. She'd roll up and down the aisles. Everybody was her friend. But you know what I did? I drove her by the hand and I kept bringing her in. I said, at some point, Lord God, you going to help this child with all this energy to sit herself still. You know what about not brought her, she would have been sitting over there right now, singing about the glory of the Lord. So don't not let the don't let don't let the devil tell you and use that as an excuse. I just curse that excuse right now in the name of Jesus. God wants y'all in this place. I didn't ask y'all to come. He sent you here. He said, "Stop turning back. Stop moving away." And in due time, he will treat you and show you. Lenaya, Lenaya, sit down. He will show you what to do and how to do it. You take authority. You have the authority in Jesus Christ to command the spirits to do what they tell them to do. We're going to be a family up in here. Amen, amen. No more excuses. No turning back. 
the devil and I ain't scared of a knee. We try, God is trying to do a work in us. He said no more half in and half out. No more excuses. That's what he said. He said no more excuses because you ain't lying to me because I already know. He said no excuses. Y'all show yourself up in here. Every last one of y'all. Now I don't apologize. God can say, Lord, I didn't mean to do that. He said, yeah, you did. You call it out. As the leader in here, I got to call it out. And I'm calling out that spirit of this fluctuating, this back and forth. We ain't fluctuating. We standing strong. We moving forward. Because one of the things that I want y'all to know is we're going to be a healthy family. Every last one of us in here, we're going to be a healthy family. We're going to be the family God has called us to be. Now we all make decisions. But my, my point to you today is don't turn back. Don't turn back. Don't turn back. Don't let fear turn you back. Don't let guilt turn you back. Don't let anger turn you back. Don't let frustration turn you back. If that stuff bothers you, you better drag yourself in here and put yourself in this little bit of altar we got and ask the Lord to say, Lord, have your way in me because I don't want to turn back. I don't want to be salty. I don't want to miss my blessing. I don't want to not be where you want me to be. I'm going to the mountain. I'm going to be elevated to the place where you call me and I'm going to be all that you call me to be. We're not going to be salty. Amen. Amen. We're going to be people filled with his spirit, walking in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. Yes. Now I'm going to do an altar call. There's some of us that need to say, Lord, let me repent because I have not, even if I haven't physically turned back, I have been turning back in my mind. I have been going back to old ways. I've been going back to old habits. I've been going back to old thinking. And today we're going to kill the turn back. We're going to slay the turn back. Because no more turn back. We're going to put a knife in it. I'm pulling out the sword. We're going to cut his head off. And we're going to not turn back no more. We're making up our mask to move forward. We're making up our mask to be unmovable. We're making up our mask. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how difficult it is. I'm not turning back. I don't know what this is going to carry for me in the future. I don't know what the mountaintop going to look like. I don't know what the journey going to be. It might be hard. It might be difficult. I might lose some folks on the lawn. And God says, some of the folks you might need to lose. Hallelujah. He said, but move, move, move. We going forward. No more turning back. Won't you stand with me? We ain't going back. We're not going back. So whatever, I don't care what it is. I'm, let's just be right, let's be honest, right here. Uh, We're we going we gonna to ask for prayer. And I want you to come forward if you need prayer. Because you say, Lord, I made a decision, but I have been back and forth. I don't want to be back and forth no more. I want to move forward with you. God is asking. <laughs> you know, God, God is a merciful and gracious God. He gives us opportunity. Young beggars. But he gives us opportunity. And so I just pray that you take the opportunities he gives you to move forward in what it is that he wants you to do. That you stop going back and forth. That your life is settled. Settle yourself in God. Settle yourself. If you're not ready to settle yourself, I'm just going to be honest with you. You're not going to find the success that you want in life if you won't settle yourself. We have to settle ourselves. Let's pray. God, we thank you today, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your mighty power. We thank you, God, that you are loving God. Now, Father, I know that this word was not one that just came off the top of my head. But, God, I'm praying right now in the name of Jesus that you would help us as your people to stop getting salty, to stop getting wound up and bitter and angry and frustrated at the things that, or the decisions that we've made and that we don't want to let go of our past. We don't want to let go of our sins. We are happy in our Sodom and Gomorrah. But Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would have your way in us. Lord God, that you would change us, change our attitude, change our behavior. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would move in us like never before. Father, I pray that you would help us to come to this place of decision. Help us to make a decision that we're not going to go back and forth, that we're going to go the long haul, that we're going to go the distance. Give us a made up mind right now in the name of Jesus. Help us, Lord God, not to feel um, 
that we, we're struggling. Some of us are struggling with trying to walk out our salvation. But I'm asking for the strength of your people right now in the name of Jesus. I'm asking, Lord God, that you would touch our young people, that you would touch everyone in this congregation, that you would help, Lord God, your people to make the decision to move and to do what you've called them to do. We pray against every spirit that will try to entice your people. We pray against the lying spirit, the deceptive spirit that tries to come in and move us and make us think that it's okay with the things we're doing, that draw us away from you. But Father, now in the name of Jesus, I speak and pray, Lord God, that you would help us to be holy because you are holy. Give us a desire to live holy lives. Holiness in our thinking. Holiness in our doing. Holiness in the things that we say and the places we go. Holiness, holy, because you are a holy God. So Father, just have your way right now in us in the midst of your people. And we just declare, Lord God, that we will do and be all that you called us to be. Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, I ask you to touch your people. I ask, Lord God, that you would raise us up. I ask, Lord God, that you would help us to be what you've called us to be. That we will not turn back. We will not move out of the pot. We will not move out of the line that you have for us. I speak blessings over our children today. Lord, even help us to be the example we need to be so that when our children see us, they will want to follow after us. Help us to be the example, Lord God, because if we have got a, a, a faulty example, then we can't expect them to have the right example or to make right choices. Help us to make right choices before them so that they can see how to make right choices. Lord God, help us to be like Abraham was and that to intercede on behalf of your people, to cry out to you when we see our loved ones and let help us have a mother in spirit, a father in spirit, desires no one to be lost and no one to suffer, then no one to be out of your will. So Father, help us to pray them and to help them so that you will send your spirit to send mercy on their lives. So Father, we thank you for right now. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you.